Okay, so I am going to use a mic. Um, it'll save my voice uh, for the next two days. Uh, but thanks, everyone, for coming, and I imagine some people will be um, coming in uh, as we go. Um, this is a workshop, and so uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I did want to say thank you for the weather. Um, and I'm actually serious. Um, I live in the San Francisco area. We never get thunder and lightning. Um, so it, I, it was like, oh, it was spectacular this morning. I was actually really happy. Um, so, <laughs> actually, I know some people that probably wouldn't mind. I mean, like, they promise it to us sometimes, and then it never happens. So, um, But... Uh, Anyway, for those that don't know, I was asked sort of where is Berkeley exactly. It's right across the bay from San Francisco. We actually can see San Francisco from the campus. So um, it's a very, very short. If we had a ferry, it would be very short. Unfortunately, we have to rely on bridges and tunnels. Um, and Berkeley's a really old university um, for, you know, for, by U.S. standards and definitely for West Coast standards where you just finish our 150th year last year, so that was exciting. Um, I direct the writing program at UC Berkeley. We're a large interdisciplinary writing program. Uh, we have creative writing, academic writing uh, of all sorts. We even do public speaking uh, as part of our curriculum, so kind of all things academic English. Uh, as a director, unfortunately, I don't teach much anymore. Um, I just do all those exciting things like schedule people's classes and <laughs> sign off on people's receipts and things. But, um, but one place that I do um, teach is online, and that's something that I've maintained um, through uh, the years. Um, and I teach um, large MOOCs um, through edX. And I was just mentioning I'm going to be back here in Hong Kong because the edX Global Forum is here in Hong Kong uh, in November. And I think it might even be at this university. So it is? OK. Because, yeah, I know that we're staying, all staying in the Icon Hotel. And someone said, well, that's right close to here. So, so I'll be back not just in Hong Kong, but right here in November. Um, so, but thanks uh, for the invitation. And thanks for coming today. And, uh, getting your feet wet and things um, literally and figuratively. Um, so one thing I'll, I usually really like to do introductions when I'm in a workshop, and uh, you know, but I also don't want to take up you know half the morning doing introductions. Um, so I don't know. Does everyone here know each other? No, good. Okay, because if you all knew each other, this would be a pointless activity. Um, <laughs> So, um, so rather than go around and have everyone say out their name, um, if you would just find like three people that you don't know um, and do a quick introduction. I mean, to me, the value of conferences is always meeting people more than whatever the speakers have to say. I didn't say that out loud. Um, so, um, so just um, take like one minute and meet a couple of people, and then we'll reconvene. <laughs>
Uh, it's actually good. It's actually really good because we're from at least five universities. I thought that that's we, what I was We do know each other, but we, this, the great thing about this club is that we have a chance to get to meet each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Give them another. Okay, did everyone get a chance to meet a couple people? Okay, um, I'll have you come back to your tables, please. mentioned this is a workshop and I actually take that word workshop fairly seriously um, also as a someone who is trained in teaching writing primarily I'm not really a big fan of lecturing and so I'll have a couple little mini lectures throughout the morning um, but mostly I'm going to be relying on you um, to talk and contribute and I'm hoping a few of you have some devices with you either laptops or phones or things because going to have you look at some things online and um, talk uh, about some things that you find. Um, one of the things, though, I always like to do before I set out for a workshop like this is set some goals for myself. Um, and um, when I thought about, you know, what is it I want to accomplish in this, um, one of the things that's in the title, of course, is the idea of autonomy. And to first work out what exactly we mean by that because if the word is thrown around a lot with lots of different meanings and uh, I think if we can kind of come to some kind of agreement on what do we mean by student autonomy what is it we want students to do when we say we want them to be autonomous um, and to identify the affordances of different educational technologies um, and I'm going to talk about this word technology and why it's not such a big deal as we think it is. Um, and then finally, I'm going to highlight a few tools that um, I use in when I'm teaching, um, and but also want to have 
some opportunity to learn some of the things you might know about um, or use. Um, and, um, but also, I say this with this kind of large caveat and that there is no magic here, right? There is no app out there. There's no piece of software that, you know, makes teaching just like flipping a switch and it all just works and students suddenly learn and are motivated and speak English perfectly. Um, there is really no magic here. Um, there are just a lot of different tools that may be worth our investigation, looking at seeing if they can help us achieve the goals that we set for ourselves. So um, those are my goals. So I want you to um, actually think about your goals. That is, why are you here? What is it when you walk out the door? Um, what is it that you'd like to kind of have in your pocket um, in terms of our discussion today? And um, I'm going to ask you to just take a minute, um, and hopefully people still carry paper and pens. I find fewer and fewer students do. <laughs> they look at me and I say, bring a pen, like, a pen. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, if you've got a paper and pen or, you know, you can do it on your phone, just um, jot down a couple of things that you'd like to get out of this session. Um, and you could share it with people at your table. And um, it looks like everyone's got a nice full table. Um, because there's going to be a lot of d table discussion going on today, I encourage you not to just kind of sit off at a table with two people or something that join in with a nice group of people. Uh, so I'm going to give you like two minutes. Take a second, write down a couple things that you'd like to walk out of here with, and then take a minute and talk to your table mates about it. There's going to be a lot of talking today. I hope it seems like from the introductions you all like talking, so I'm happy with that. Okay, um, I'd love to hear from each table a couple of goals that you have, and lest you think I'm just checking my text or something, I actually have my notes for my slides on my phone, so um, can we start here? Just um, You don't have to say them all, but a couple of goals that seemed important from your group, from the discussion, any?
Okay. Great. So some new, some new technology that might be useful in your context. How about this table here? Okay, great, yeah, so using technology to motivate, um, you know, we have a generation of students in general that kind of don't know a life without the kind of digital technology um, that some of us, it's still, I mean, even though I've been using it for a long time, it's, it's very different than, you know, when I was a kid when, you know, thank God my parents couldn't track me with a cell phone all day. Um, so, um, you know, it's a very different kind of outlook on how the world works when you are findable all the time, for example. Um, how about this table in back? Okay. Great. Okay. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That's going to come kind of late in the talk, but we will get to it. Um, both using things that we already use, but maybe in different ways, and what not to do, <laughs> or some of the ways that technology kind of fails us. I think. Um, so coming back up to this table here, anything to add to the list that? I'm not sure if um, Julia like in order to my colleagues, like uh, my flying technology in college. Oh. Julia, I, I do encounter a lot of problems of them in flight. Yeah, I saw some like little online meme or joke or something last night that said, you know, um, News has it that we're just 10 years away from a fully functioning printer. Um, no. And <laughs> I thought, yeah, you know, technology is still not always flawless. So uh, how about this? Anything to add? Well, the points I wrote down have already Have been covered. Yeah, that's always the problem when you get to the later groups, right? So yeah, what they said. Um, anything you want to add for either this table and then towards Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So, and then Adam Seville back there. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, um, I, I'm glad you brought up Google Translate, which I had this moment this morning as I woke up saying, I haven't really planned to talk about Google Translate, but I know it's a big um, issue in language learning, and you know, there's this whole new phenomenon called translation plagiarism um, that's become an issue, and there's very split opinions about whether this is something that we should care about or not. Um, Okay, so now back to another group discussion. I, I promise I will have some things to say in a second, but um, I want to just preface kind of what um, I'm going to talk about. One of the things about autonomy is that um, it is very culturally bound, and I'll talk about this um, in a bit. So I'm kind of curious, and I will want to hear from some of you, what does autonomy mean in your context here? Um, you know, what does it mean for a student to be an autonomous learner. Um, and then why do, why do we even use digital technology? I don't say technology, but digital technology in classrooms. We all use technology. A pencil is technology. But, um, and then um, what do you, use, you know, put to use? Uh, a few people have mentioned sort of Google Docs and some other things, but maybe there's some other tools. So, um, and as I say, speaking of Google Docs, um, if you have a device with you, if someone at the table could add their notes to this document, um, th that's obviously just a short URL because the Google URL is impossibly long. Uh, and you'll see there, there's a place for notes already set up. And this is, um, I know probably a lot of you already use Google Docs, but this is one of the things that a lot of our instructors do in our program for collaborative take 
in class, is to set up a Google Doc um, and have students take notes and reflect through the class um, experience and add to this collaborative document. And sometimes the students are, some students will be assigned to be an editor. So when students put up notes, if they find errors, um, then their job is to go in and fix any grammar, punctuation errors and things. So um, I'm going to bring this Google Doc up as you discuss things. It might take me a bit because this is on our university server and we have about 90 levels of security that I'm going to have to go through to get to it, but um, I think we'll be able to do it. So about five minute discussion on these three topics. And if someone at the table has um, yeah, either a laptop or something that they can type notes on, that would be helpful. Oh, yeah, of course I don't have to do security because I opened this to the world. So, yes, that was smart of me. <laughs> do 
need the address again? Let's see, I'll give it to you here. Somewhere here I have it. Downloaded the app. Oh, this is my old version. Let me, here. So, there's the uh, address again. So you got in there. Perfect. Okay, I'll give you one more minute if you want to add anything. I'd like seeing this list of technology you use, lots of uh, things I don't use. Okay, um, so I encourage you to bookmark that page if you want to go back to some of these notes or you want to add things. Um, so um, I want to talk a little, we'll start with the discussion of learner autonomy and what exactly it is and what it might be for me that's different um, than for you in your context. Um, but I really like this quotation from McGarry. Um, who, um, there's so many definitions out there. As I was putting this workshop together, um, just seeing, and you'll see from the very, what I think is, you know, almost circular definitions um, to the more complex and fleshed out ones. But this one I liked because um, kind of covers all the bases. Um, students who are encouraged to take responsibility for their own work mm -hmm. by being given some control over what, how, and when they learn are more likely to be able to set realistic goals 
plan programs of work, develop strategies for coping with new and unforeseen situations, evaluate and assess their own work, and generally to learn how to learn from their own successes and failures in ways which will help them to be more efficient learners in the future. And so I think it kind of encapsulates not only the sort of what, but the why and how a bit. Um, so some of the basics, um, and you covered a lot of these in your notes already, so I'm not going to belabor um, some of these points. But um, one is, of course, the, it requires learner willingness to take responsibility for their own learning. Um, you know, so it requires that initial buy-in, in a way, for of the students saying or indicating that they're willing to be a kind of active, um, if not proactive, participant in the process. Um, Total autonomy is probably an over-idealistic goal. Um, one of my uh, favorite stories about um, one of the mistakes I think sometimes teachers do is like, I mean, imagine I had come in here and said, okay, this is a workshop, so you're all just gonna do the work. Tell me, you know, what should we do today? Um, <laughs> Right. And a friend of mine said, imagine that you were going to do a like, technical mountain climbing class, right? And, you know, and like lives kind of hang in the balance on this one. And you walk in, and the person teaching it says, OK, so what would you like to learn? Um, your faith in you know, that instructor probably diminishes greatly. So it, autonomy needs to strike this good balance between you know, the, the instructor is still kind of the expert in the room, or we certainly hope so. Um, but it doesn't mean that the student is completely kind of enthralled to everything that the instructor says and tells them to do. So there are different degrees of autonomy. Um, I think often autonomy is confused with independent learning. Um, if you give your students an assignment and say, go home and do this on your own, that's not autonomy. That's them just doing something you told them to do on their own. Um, autonomy really has to do with kind of the whole mechanism of being engaged and motivated um, to learn without someone giving you the assignment and saying, go do this and have it done by Friday at noon or whatever. Um, and it's not merely just giving students a set of strategies. You know, here are some ways to learn on your own. Um, it's really putting them into practice both inside and outside the classroom. Um, autonomous learning can happen in a classroom setting. It doesn't just mean that they're at home on their own. And it has cultural and political implications. Um, there are different expectations of teachers in different contexts. Um, and some school boards, parents, politicians, all of that um, will have different opinions about how autonomous um, students should be in their learning and what kinds of strategies. And of course, um, you know, we, we sometimes live with these assumptions about what it is we do. Um, in the workshop I'm going to give on Thursday, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, why a lot of the stuff we do with marking and responding to writing um, has to do as much with proving that we're doing our jobs as it is with helping students to learn. Right. If I comment a lot, then everybody knows that I'm on the job. Right. Uh, so, um, so types of and contributors to autonomy, and this is a very simplified version from this article. Um, there's just simply the denotative or the, you know the meaning of it: learning outside the structure of an educational institution and without the intervention of a teacher. Um, and I think it's a bit of an overstatement to say without the intervention of a teacher. Um, you know, but I think it's more um, teacher as guide, um, teacher as facilitator, um, as opposed to just being an absent character. Um, there's, and then the psychological component of autonomy, um, the attitudes and abilities that enable learners to take that responsibility, right? They have to um, kind of have that psychological orientation that allows them to organize their own learning, to stay on task. And the question came up about my teaching online courses. This is a huge issue for students who learn online. And that's, that's just a teaser for my plenary tomorrow. So, um, and then um, political. You know, who has control of the processes? Um, uh, and I'm not going to talk about this third one 
as much, but it's definitely something we need to keep in mind as we think about what we're asking our students to do. There we go. Um, so some activities that help promote autonomy. Um, just as we did with this workshop, have students set goals and actions at the beginning of an assignment. Um, a lot of times students kind of fail to get engaged or fail to act autonomously with regard to an assignment because they don't know what the point of the assignment is. It seems like busy work to them or it's just something the teacher gave me. I don't know why, you know, I just do it because she told me to. Um, so a really good thing to do is one, explain what the purpose of the assignment. With this assignment, you're going to learn how to X. And then two, ask them to sit down and say, okay, what are their goals for that assignment? And what are the actions that they're going to take to achieve those goals? Um, so I might, before I give my students a big research paper, for example, um, I might ask them, you know, so what's the purpose of doing this research paper? Um, you know, and they could come up with 50 reasons, probably. And what are the action steps? And just breaking it down. Writing a 20-page research paper is a huge task. Doing 20 small bits is not so bad. Um, have students reflect in writing or orally on their completed assignments. Um, and as a program for our first semester students, this is actually part of the final assessment, is that students have to write a three-page reflection on the entire semester. Where did they start? What did they learn? How did they learn it? What do they still need to learn? What are they still working on? Um, and that's part of what gets assessed in their final writing project. Um, what did they find difficult? And these are really um, insightful bits of information for the instructor to have um, because I, it took me a while to discover I'm uh, an extremely oral learner. It turns out I'm kind of an oral teacher as well. And, for, um, and those things correlate really tightly. And so for a long time, um, students struggled with knowing what their assignments were. And I couldn't figure out why until a student like wrote in one of their assessments like you know I need to learn to listen better because she you know since you don't write things on the board much I thought oh yeah um, like I would just sort of bark out assignments as they're leaving the room um, so it, to me that was a real insightful comment that the student wasn't criticizing just saying you know I need to listen better because she gives things orally rather than in writing um, Um, ha and having students create guidelines and materials collaboratively. Um, one of the tasks that we do frequently is to have students do a collaborative rubric um, for writing. And they end up looking exactly like the rubric that we write, <laughs> um, with a couple of exceptions. And it, it's a really nice way to get insights into what students think they should be graded on. Um, for example, one of the categories that is not on our official rubric but comes up um, a lot when students create a rubric is effort. Um, you know, they believe they should be given a score for effort. Um, and it leads to a really nice discussion about how an instructor can't observe or measure effort. And that, in fact, in the end, it might not matter. And, you know, I always tell them, you know, think about your a surgeon. You're going to go in for surgery, but the surgeon, you know, amputates the wrong leg. But he tried really hard. He put in a lot of effort into that. Um, you know, does that matter in the end? Does it matter that maybe you can write a beautiful, you know, perfectly um, written A paper, and it only takes you a couple of days while someone else labors over it for a couple of weeks? Um, does that matter if the product turns out to be a good one. So it leads to some really interesting discussions to have students um, really think about the grading process, the marking process, um, and what kinds of activities should be focused on in the classroom. And it gives them ownership uh, again and lets them kind of buy into the process. All right, so now the technology part of this. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's no real magic here. Uh, I, my undergraduate degree is in anthropology, so I often go back to these anthropological uh, descriptions of things. And um, anthropology just 
defines technology as a body of knowledge available to a society that is of use in fashioning implements, practicing manual arts and skills, and extracting or collecting materials. I mean, that is technology. And we sometimes use technology as this buzzword to refer to only kind of the digital technology or the visual technology that we use. But technology is our built environment, it includes pencils, right? Uh, whiteboards, classrooms. Um, I was talking to this lovely group of um, teachers here before um, we began, um, and I mentioned that at my uni since we're an old university, a lot of my classrooms still just have chalkboards. And students, um, new students in particular, are often just amazed. <laughs> I actually had a student once say, is that a chalkboard? <laughs> and I said, yeah. My dad told me about those. <laughs> um, so we're seeing students now that don't have some of the experience with kind of these simple technologies, but they are still technologies. And they, each of these technologies has an affordance of some type. There are certain things you do with a chalkboard. Um, there are certain things you do with a whiteboard um, that are slightly different than a chalkboard, even though the intention for that piece of technology is the same. And of course, computers and internet has just recently been added to the list. But you know, think about centuries ago when books um, printed uh, by printing presses were added to the list and what um, a disruptive technology that was at the time, right? I mean, there was a lot of, you know, kind of people were aghast. You know, how are people going to learn if they just rely on books and they can just look things up? Um, they don't have to, um, you know, memorize things anymore. So um, I'm going to talk about oop, sorry. Um, some of the affordances of digital technology. And this is something I think about since I teach classes that are completely online. Um, and one of the things that technology can do for us right now in its current state is actually replicate some of the classroom experiences that students have. Discussion boards, although I'm going to talk later about the major failure of discussion boards, um, video lectures, um, you know, or video clips of some kind to bring in kind of the outside world. Um, I don't, when I um, put online courses together, I actually don't do much in the way of video lectures. Uh, I, I am a firm belief that people don't actually learn how to write by watching someone else's mouth move and sound come out of it. Um, that if you want to learn to write, you sit down and you write um, and you practice writing. Uh, but nonetheless, there are little mini lectures that might come up. They're usually PowerPoint slides that have narration. Um, of course, you can do reading online, quizzes, um, both open-ended, self-graded, all of that. Um, feedback. Um, at our university, we have something called Speed Grader. Does anyone, is that available here? Yeah. Um, it's part of Canvas, uh, and um, it allows you to take a piece of writing and very quickly write some comments on it. Um, we also have an audio commentary system that's built into it, which I prefer. I like talking a student through their paper rather than just writing a lot of written comments all over it. Um, and so both automated feedback systems and live, meaning commenting or audio commenting. Um, a, one of my colleagues just did a demo, in fact, of video commenting. She actually puts little video clips of herself. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, in the paper, you know, and the student can click and see her face explaining things. I mean, I guess if you're really photogenic, maybe. <laughs> Um, you know, can replicate some authentic experiences, authentic materials, video, virtual reality is starting to come into play uh, in some of this. I haven't done anything with VR, uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and then um, students in charge of the curriculum, putting together um, their own plans and materials, their course of action. How are they going to study? Um, and they often, and we see students do this all the time, amass things from different online sources, find readings, find videos, go to a TED talk um, to learn about a topic that they're interested in. Um, but the question I think we have to ask ourselves at the end of this is, um, you know, 
do these affordances end up driving our educational goals? And I think we have to be very cautious um, to not allow them to you know, always have the, our own goals be first and let the educational technology follow the goals rather than the reverse. And I do see the reverse happening sometimes. And um, I will say I'm also, though, not one of those people who says never use a piece of technology if you don't know how to use it. Um, it's kind of like saying, oh, by the way, don't ever experiment with anything because you wouldn't want to actually try out something new. Um, it might fail. And like, we've all had major failures in our classrooms with and without technology. I just, we just, our, our university just sponsored this great conference called the Conference of Teaching Failure. And all the talks had to be something that you did that was a massive failure in the class. The best conference I've ever been to. It was so much fun. Um, so yeah, so the affordances and educational goals, there's a little bit of chicken and egg thing going on there. Um, I have questions thought so far, but we're actually like a wee bit behind schedule, which is actually not a bad thing. But I want to give you a little bit of a five minute stretch break, get some water, walk around. So um, let's come back at about no later than 11.27. How's that for precision? <laughs> Oh, that clock is a bit fast. <laughs> I have 1121 right here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. That's all right. Okay. Okay, there we go. Perfect. So I'll bring these websites up and show you, um, in case you're wondering about the URLs, everything is just what it is up there dot com. So um, of course, write or die is all one um, word. It's a very clever name, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so uh, Sarah Go, and I'm going to say I have no connection to any of these companies. I have friends that work for some of them, but I have if I had connections to some of these companies, I'd be probably doing a lot, driving a lot nicer car than I uh, currently do. Um, so Sarago is an interesting new um, piece of technology, and feel free to play with your gadgets while I'm talking. I'd like you know, if you want to look at them, I'll I'll bring them up in a second. Um, it um, the CEO of Sarago is actually a PhD in cognitive psychology. Um, and uh, has built this system that um, builds in kind of a study schedule of concepts and things that the instructor can set up based on how well they did in their last session. So it's adaptive to what the student is working on. Um, and it doesn't, oh, it, you know, the goal is not to overtrain, get just the right amount, <coughs> excuse me, of learning. Um, and regular review of concepts and things. So um, it's a really interesting um, little piece of software. Um, I haven't yet done anything with it. I will say officially in classes, we're looking at it as a way to augment some of our summer courses. At UC Berkeley, we have our regular program during the year, but then we have a visitor's program in the summer. We have about 1,500 students that visit our campus um, in July and mid to mid-August um, and take English classes. Um, and um, so we're looking at how to integrate um, Sarago into some of those courses, some of the vocabulary courses, for example, or things that are more easily tested on you know, uh, this kind of adaptive system. Um, Poll Everywhere is something our large classes on campus are using. Dis does anyone know? Like, uh, does anyone know or use a poll everywhere already? Yeah, so some people already do. Um, we used to just have a, a proprietary clicker system on campus, and students would have to 
pay like $50 to rent a clicker for the semester and um, faculty were using it to keep attendance in their large classes. You know, you had to click in with your clicker, um, but students would give each other their clickers to <laughs> take and uh, register. And um, so now um, they've gone to um, poll everywhere, which requires you to use a phone. And they've discovered, of course, students are much less likely to want to hand their phone off to someone uh, for a few hours to have them um, register their attendance. So um, in fact, it's the non-proprietary system has worked out much better. And I'll show, for those who don't know Poll Everywhere, I'll show that in a second. Write or die, um, as a writing instructor, I will tell you, the, what do you imagine the biggest um, sort of, not complaint, but problem that students express about writing? Writer's block, exactly. Getting started actually writing um, and not just sitting and staring at the screen and wondering what they should be doing. Um, Write or Die is a very funny little piece of software um, that sets a timer, gives you just a blank screen, and you set your goal, how many words you want to write in how much time. And then it gives you um, feedback, uh, meaning if you meet your goal, it shows you videos of kittens. Um, and if you don't, it plays horrible sounds and things. But it, it's actually, students have a lot of fun with it. It's a, kind of a cool tool for just getting writing. Um, because as we all know, you know, if anybody who's written anything knows that half the battle is just getting started writing something, anything. Once you've got something down, you can fix it. But if you don't have anything on the screen, you can't fix it. And then Grammarly, which I'm sure almost everyone is familiar with, and it, it's now expanded into all kinds of add-ins. You know, you can add it to your operating system, um, add it to your phone. It has its own keyboard, um, and it's just a grammar checker. And we're going to talk a little bit about limitations of grammar checkers, although I know you're well aware of the limitations of grammar checkers. Um, so let me just bring up, uh, for those who I just want to bring up the write or die screen, for example. Um, so um, set your uh, timer uh, how, and how fast you type. 25 words a minute, that's sad. Um, the word goal. I mean, 25, I don't know what, I mean, I actually took typing class, you know, I, I'm of that generation where we still took typing classes, so like 25 words a minute seems like you could just do on your phone or something, but, um, and uh, so you set it all up, and then you just get this blank white screen, and you just, the timer goes, and you just type, um, and you see the timer going, and you just type and type and type, and you can adjust, um, and then you have your consequence mode, um, so stimulus mode cheers you on. Um, consequence mode gives you like nasty videos. Kamikaze mode I, is new. I actually haven't tried this, so I'm not sure what that is. But there's a, there's a setting where if you don't type for a few seconds, it will start deleting. Okay. Oh, oh, that's evil. That is evil. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it gives you a warning before it starts deleting your writing. And then you can download it as a text file and import it into Word or whatever your word processing system works. A lot of my students, when um, they felt like they just didn't know how to get started, we would use this in class. I would say, you're just going to use write or die. It doesn't matter what you write. But it's amazing how after like two minutes of just writing nonsense, like ideas start to percolate and some things start to appear on the screen that could possibly be useful in something that they're going to write. I know this is what happens for me. Um, a lot of times I have to throw away whole pages of stuff I've written to finally get to, oh yeah, there's the idea I'm looking for. You know, it's in there, but it just took a lot of nonsense. Um, okay, let's go back to this. Um, Grammarly, everybody knows, so poll everywhere. Um, Oh, I think I'd have to log in. I actually do have a poll up here if you want to take it. Um, so um, I'll 
I'll write the uh, address of there. Um, I use this with graduate students a lot. I teach a graduate training program. Um, and we use it to um, get anonymously at some things I want to talk about with them, but that they may be afraid to talk about openly in class. So for example, the poll that you'll see if you dig around and find it in a minute. Um, one of the issues in writing um, that a lot of, I see young instructors, graduate student instructors have, um, is they, they don't yet know how to conceptualize their role as a teacher. And especially in writing, you see instructors, um, I, I call it this, the three, the three part problem. They see themselves either as tutors, so they're spending way too much individual time with each student, and it's eating up all of their time, and they're not getting much done because they spend all of their time conferencing with students. Or the editor problem. They spend all of their time marking, writing long, copious notes on every piece of writing, um, acting more as an editor. Or then, but then there's the guide, um, the person who helps the student become that more autonomous viewer of his or her own writing. Um, and so, um, so one of, but I find when I pose this question to students, like which of these are you, they won't say. Because they're afraid there's a wrong answer. Um, like, oh, if I admit that I'm more of an editor, like she's going to think I'm not a good teacher. So we use poll edit or poll everywhere as a way to get at kind of anonymous um, answers, and then we can just talk about that. There's not really a wrong answer there. Um, it's just these are different approaches to the teaching task. Um, okay, let me go back to this. So um, time for some work. I want um, at your tables, if you'd take some time and, you know, as is clear, some of you have already used some of these things. Um, if you would just explore any or all of the four, you could, you know, different people at the table might look at different things. I don't care. Um, and also, if you have some other tool that you've used that you'd like other people to know about or to talk about, um, add that in. Um, we've got another note, a separate note page um, for this. But um, as you look at them, think, how could students use um, any of these tools? You know, can you think of any use for them? You might not. Um, again, go back and think about what are the goals um, that you have for your students and for your classes, and do any of these tools fit those goals? Um, do they answer a question or address a problem that you already have? Um, and then what other tools you have, and add your notes there, because um, I am going to ask you, um, there was a short list of some of the other tools you're using. I'd like to kind of talk more about those as well. We're, we're doing okay on time. We'll have time to get to some of the other things too. So about 10 minutes, just kind of poke around, see what you can find on these, and then um, we'll come back together and talk about them. And if you have trouble or questions about any of the, call me over. I'm mobile today, so.
You can almost see that. <laughs> Here's one of the advantages of chalkboard. They don't run out of ink. If you, yeah. I just want to ask you about the right time. Having not taken a typing lessons, what is a reasonable word per minute to set students? I think for someone who's not a skilled typist, probably 50 to 60 um, is. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> uh, you think it's less than that? Oh, I have, we have no idea. Good. I mean, I type like 110 words a minute. <laughs> but I, you know, I. So I always figured people would probably be like half that speed if they're not like super trained. It's not just the typing though, it's like also they're going to be thinking about the, the language. Right. right. Yeah. So it yeah. would have to be significantly, for it to be reasonable, it would have to be much slower. Yes, that's true. Yeah, because they're inventing as they're typing. Yeah. So, um, but, um, so probably 25 is reasonable for that kind of task on there. I mean, I just like go in and write like super fast. So 50, I think, you know, that's why I thought 50 to 60 sounded good, but maybe not. <laughs> Might not be reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thinking right, it has to say it in English, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think now that I know what kamikaze mode means, um, it seems like a good test to find out. Well, the other thing you can do, there's all kinds of online typing tests you can do, but um, is to put it in kamikaze mode and see what your rate is before it starts deleting things, um, and then you probably know, like, oh, okay. Maybe 20 words a minute is okay or yeah. something. Um, and it probably depends on the kind of writing you're asking them to do as well. Um, Yeah, yes. yeah. Sorry, I want to make sure. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. 
Syria. <laughs> okay, I heard you. What you what you say? Um, no, I mean, you know, I think. Yeah, we have assessment obsession sometimes, and think that everything students produce has to be assessed in some way, and it just it just doesn't, you know. And, and it's also not really realistic in thinking about like once they're outside of kind of educational constraints. I mean, there are things will be assessed, but in a very different way. They're going to be assessed for, you know, do they effectively. You know, I give information about this product, or do they write, you know, a letter that effectively appeals for an extension on a loan, or, you know, not like, well, you know, you're not using the past participle correctly in all cases, or you know, so, um, yeah. So it's nice. Like, this kind of activity is just like not graded. Usually, when I have students do it, they just got credit. I actually give them credit. I, I, I always call this the volume assignment. So they got volume credit. The more you write, the more points you get. Um, so I say everybody starts with ten, and then you know it goes down if you don't produce at least. And it changed over the semester. So very short expectation at the beginning because it's a very new idea. Like, what do you mean I can just make mistakes and got, you don't care? Like you know, and they're correcting everything and spitting out two sentences in a 10 minute period or something. Um, no, we get, a, um, our program, we're about one third international, one third immigrant, and one third American. So we're really, right, a lot, yeah. Um, and most of our international students these days, you can guess where they're from. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Well, we're particularly popular too. With uh, yes. so, you know, part of the world. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's great. You know, we're, we're very happy with that. Actually, um, it's. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all read a lot of personal statements for going to this university. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and our summer program, I said, like we have 1,500 visitors, probably 13 to 1,400 of them are from China, Hong Kong. Yeah. Wow. So. Um, um, we talk a lot about text and genre-based text, and um, you know, try to get students kind of aware of different genre, like especially in academic writing, um, that you know the expectations that we put on them are going to be very different than in chemistry or in econ or something. Although surprisingly, we're finding less of a difference than we used to presume. I mean, I think it's kind of the writing teacher's fiction that we. I like to imagine these people in this other part of the university do these very different things than we do. And it turns out it's actually not that different. Yeah, yeah, lab report, yeah. One of my graduate students this past fall did this brilliant um, presentation about talking about how lab reports are really just a narrative. And she looked at like the narrative quality of, you know, it's just like, and it's just a narrative though where you have to decide which details are the relevant details for the narrative, you know. and this brilliant activity with students where she gave them the full narrative like everything that happened during an experiment everything from the janitor came in and emptied the trash um, one of the mice died you know all these things and the students have to go through and determine like what are the relevant parts of this narrative and what do you get rid of you know what oops. and it's just like you know it is it's all about story and writing a story whether it's a lab report or a history paper yeah exactly yeah it's like what are the facts that a reader needs um, the reader doesn't need to know about the trash being emptied <laughs> But it was surprising because you know the uh, the mice dying. It was she had included this um, what you know mice get shipped from wherever they get shipped from, and that ten of them arrived dead. And she said you know most students thought that that was a relevant detail, and so you know it was a good discussion about why it's not a relevant detail. It doesn't matter to the experiment. That so, uh, yeah, there is it. All right, how are we doing on time? We're okay. Okay.
What other, did you guys have other tools you all use? Oh, I didn't know that. It's something that's hard to do. Okay. Like charts and things. Oh. Okay. So like those word map yes, things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there, I mean, there's so much we have to do. I mean, you know, that's the problem. It's like they learn about all these great things, and then it's like, when do I do this? Because uh, we're 15 weeks. Yeah. Okay. So. I mean, it's a lot to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, 15 includes one week pre-exam and one week of exam. So it's. 13 weeks of class time yeah. and then 15 weeks semester. So, so we're done actually. Yeah. We're done that so for two weeks. <laughs> so happy. <laughs> but all of our international visitors arrive soon. So when they start arriving June 10th. <laughs> the mass culture shock. I mean, it's a, it's stunning, you know, when you get that many people arriving all at the same time, and it's just, they're all lost, and <laughs> like, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah, there's that, but what we're encountering is, there's also sometimes overall disappointment, because of course the students that come don't realize that everyone else that is coming is also from China. And I mean, and students will actually say things to us like, if I knew I was gonna be in the same class with people from my high school, like I wouldn't have bothered to come here, I can stay in China and do that, you know. Um, and it's like, sorry, you know, we can't tell people not to come. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. yeah, we have a bad enough history with that in San Francisco. <laughs> we wanna do go down that road again. Say how we're doing on time. All right, let me check my Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we have about a half hour left. Um, I hope you got a chance to look around at anything that might have been new to you, but I'm especially interested in hearing other tools, I heard one from this group already, um, what other tools you might be using or interested in using um, that uh, we could add to our, our list. And I don't know if everyone found that, that poll everywhere thing there, that's my poll that's open right now if you want to um, tell me if you're an editor or a um, tutor or a guide. Um, but. Uh, so when we start here at our very large table here, uh, <coughs> uh, what did you find that was interesting or um, any other tools that you wanted to add to the list of things that are used in your classes? We, um, okay, I'm going to play with that with everything. Okay. Um, we didn't like Zorigo. Um, okay. It's okay. Uh, like I said, I've, I've got... I think the concern about thing is if we think about it, you know, like the students are already not very motivated, you know, to do something like related to their study. And if we ask them to do something extra in order to get the resources, it's not really... Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, I don't know, did everyone hear that? So the idea of like adding additional things sometimes can be demotivating rather than motivating um, for students. And we didn't like the grammar either uh, because the premium versions uh, cost quite a bit of money. Mm. And the free one, uh, some of us used it before and didn't particularly find it useful, which is logical because, you know, why would you pay for something right. that is not really as 
great value and yeah. you would get it for free. Right or die, um, we also thought um, it was not it's Actually, easy. I thought it would be really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my yeah. Because my students have a right in class when I ask them to write. They just sit for 10 minutes and they don't produce anything. So I think this might be something that would actually push them and encourage them. And if they're a little like squeaky mice and whatever, I don't know, maybe less things. Yeah, I mean, um, so I've used write or die, and actually I've used what I like to call the paper version of it, um, where um, I just set a timer and tell them they have to start writing anything. Um, and they start out the assignment, everybody gets 10 points. But every time I find them deleting and editing, they lose a point. Um, and every time they stop and don't write for more than like 10 seconds, they lose a point. Um, and at the beginning, it's, you know, nobody's getting any points because they're, they're so used to, and this is our fault, people. This is not their fault. They're so used to having to carefully craft perfect sentences um, that it's really difficult for them to imagine an environment where they can just write and nobody cares. Nobody cares if the punctuation isn't right or if it's spelled incorrectly. Um, and so it's very difficult at first. And using write or die, or like I said, the paper version, it's very difficult um, for our students who, like Berkeley students in particular, have mostly been the best students at their high school, the perfectionists, um, the I do everything right, um, I've always gotten perfect marks. Um, and so to kind of get them out of that zone where they believe like every sentence they write has to be perfectly formed is really hard. Um, and yeah, so the first couple of times I might get a couple very well-formed sentences with lots of evidence of editing. And for those perfectly formed sentences, they get zero points. For the student who just goes to town and writes pages, um, in the time allotted and really takes it to heart. Like, I am not going to edit. I'm not going to go back and review my spelling. Um, that's for a later stage. That's, you know, that's for when I revise things. Um, they get more points. And by the end, like, students are just writing reams of things where that first day of class they're like, I can't do this. This is not possible. Um, I don't know what to write. Um, I was telling people at this table my favorite, one of my favorite outcomes when I did this activity with a group of first semester students is student didn't know what to write about, so her pen was sitting on the table, so she thought, I'm going to write about the color of my pen. She had a purple pen. And so she just started writing a lot of stuff about, you know, I have, why do I have a purple pen? Um, but by the end, she actually had this really nice kind of first draft of an essay about why the color purple was important in her life, um, what it meant to her, um, and that it wasn't just a pen. It had kind of more meaning to her than simply the pen. So she had this really great idea that was kind of coaxed out of her by having that time constraint um, put on her. So I think it can be really useful at the beginning stage of writing. I don't think it's particularly useful if you're having them do a final draft of a research paper, right? This is not the tool for that. And that's kind of what I mean for matching your goals to your tools very carefully. Um, you know, this write or die is great for that kind of just write fast, get it out of your head and onto the screen, and then we'll worry about fixing it up and editing it later. Um, and then, uh, let's see, so we pull everyone up. Yeah. Oh yeah, what, so tell me about Yo Teach, because I've seen it, I've not played with it at all. Uh, that's, actually, that's actually developed by our colleagues at the university. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's Bravo. That's a platform that students who don't have to walk in, and then our teachers have to create a room, and the students go to the room and then do whatever teachers ask them to do, or they even use the phone and they do bad. Okay, oh great. Oh, that so it was developed. In this case, at a university, you can use it. Okay. Oh, that's great. Oh, I'll we'll have to look at that. That's, um, a lot of instructors at our university, I'll talk about discussion boards and their limitations in a minute, use Piazza, which I think is kind of similar. Um, but our university's discouraging us from using it because of privacy, because Piazza 
uses student data and we're not allowed to have to use tools that harvest student data for commercial purposes so um, let's see I'm kind of going always in the same direction so how about we go to the other end of the room sorry I'm gonna put all y'all, as we say. Um, um, how, did you have any other tools or any thoughts on the ones that? Well, we were discussing autonomy systems mm -hmm. because some of these people everywhere do not really talk about autonomy per se, like you know, very much here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those collocation um, tools, and there's several of them um, uh, online, are really useful um, for writing or for grammar classes and things, as you said, to learn what tools go together. I did want to mention, for the Poll Everywhere tool, um, I was actually introduced to that by students using it um, together um, and in doing um, presentations in class. So um, it can be student driven um, and they came up with using it. Um, they, they were assigned to lead a class discussion and they put together a poll on their own and used it with, their, um, with other students in the class. And it was great because then they had to write the poll items, um, they gathered the data and had to write the interpretation of it. So it can, um, I mean I think you're right, if it's just used by the teacher um, to gather information from students it doesn't really say much to the issue of autonomy, but students can use it, um, you know, to do their own kinds of projects as well. Um, how about here by the pillar? Um, well, there's, there's a program that I'd like to ask if anybody else has, has used, uh, the, I, I've just seen in a training session here, uh, it's out of Harvard, it's called Perusal, Perusal with an extra L. Does anybody <laughs> use it? It's, it's feature is that it's, um, I think you, you put up a reading or something like that and it asks students to comment on it. Uh, and it claims to be able to rate those students' comments and uh, in terms of, of, of quality. Um, I assume it's looking at, at, at lexical choice and some syntax or, or, or something like that, I don't know. Um, but it would be, uh, it would be nice to have something with some AI in it to do a little bit, tiny bit of your grading for you. And uh, that, that could be motivating for the students, um, but I know no more. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. So um, kind of in the next, the last kind of slide of substance that we're talking about some of the limitations of using discussion boards as kind of motivators and, you know, marking and things like that. And so that, might go some way in addressing some of the problems with discussion boards. Um, yeah, I'll have a look at it. So peruse all. Yes. Peruse okay. All with an extra L. L. Okay. Yeah. Um, anybody else have? Yes.
Oh, that sounds great. So what's the name of that again? G-O-N-G-Y-E-H. Y-E-H. Gong, yeah. Y-E-H. Dot com? Oh, it's just the name of the app. Okay, got it. Oh, I'll have a look at that. They are public speaking classes would be interested in that. Um, anybody else have one they want to share before we get to the last points of the day? It's already 12.10. Okay. Um, let's see where we are. Uh, okay. So um, as promised, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, sort of the affordances of these things, how we can have students use them well, and how I think they're either poorly designed or misused. <laughs> um, sort of all of those things. And I invite you to add your own uh, kind of comments on these. So the first is discussion boards. Um, so most on, you know, if you use Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle or some other kind of learning management system, they're going to have discussion boards. And you might not be surprised to hear, if you look at discussion boards today, and you go back and you can still see screenshots of discussion boards from like 1997. They look almost identical. Um, and this is particularly true in educational software. And I've actually talked to engineers at edX and a few to complain about this um, because what happens with discussion boards, and I think one of the things that make them demotivating and um, not, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but our students, like if we give them discussion board assignments, they'll do them. But they are just going through the motions, right? They're doing it because it was assigned. They're not doing it because they really want to engage in this great online discussion about the reading or, you know, some other um, kind of activity. They just, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. Mm, now I did my assignment. Um, one of the things that's become really obvious to me in the affordances of educational discussion boards versus social media. Educational discussion boards are topic driven, right? So what's the first thing you do? You go on and, you know, answer to question two or um, in my case often, we, you know, even though we try to train students better, subject lines that say things like help or hello, um, or other things that really don't give the reader any idea what's going to be in that message should they open it. And so discussion boards, I think, um, are greatly underutilized because of their design. Um, if you look at social media, social media is organized around people, right? Um, if, you know, if you have a Facebook page or you have Twitter or something, you follow particular accounts or people. You don't follow a topic. Um, and educational software, well, of course, we don't want it to be exactly like Facebook. Um, we also need to capture some of what makes social media attractive to respond. And in looking at it, it really does have to do with Educational software seems to take the focus off of individuals and turns it to the material. Um, so I always tell instructors, if they can find a way to make um, their discussion boards in class much more people forward. Um, and with some 
software, it's harder than others to do this. Um, but Waze, uh, I think the edX software now like allows, it doesn't allow you to follow others. It still only allows you to follow posts. Um, but at least you can do that, you know, as opposed to just kind of going in and hoping that you can find your discussion topic again. And this is a problem also with large online courses. Um, and, you know, someone mentioned flipped classes in the uh, beginning. Like even tracking down, um, you know, oh, gee, I posted a question three days ago. Now, now where is it? It's scrolled by. I have to dig down like, like these topics from three days ago and I can't find it. And maybe someone gave me a really good answer. I would never know. Um, so those are the problems with discussion boards. On the other hand, if you're teaching a flipped class or an online class, especially if it focuses on writing, discussion boards are writing. Um, so it's a lot, you know, it's a really good opportunity for students to practice writing because they have to articulate things um, in the written form. We haven't really talked about plagiarism checkers and um, I turn it in, right? So, so here's my, so Yo Teach was developed here. Turn it in was developed at Berkeley. Um, actually, uh, so you're to blame. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I really am. Um, but I will tell you how it happened. It was actually one of my graduate students was one of the people that developed it. Uh, he was a microbiology graduate student. Um, he was one of my graduate students because he taught writing. Um, and then he had a friend who uh, taught microbiology. And they decided to have a grading party, which graduate students do. Sometimes they all get together, grade the same papers, you know, sit and talk and drink coffee and grade. And he said to one of the other graduate students, oh, look at, you know, will you have a look at this paper? And the other graduate student said, I just read that paper. <laughs> and another student said, let me look at that. He said, I just read that paper too. And it was the same paper was submitted to eight different TAs by different students. And so they were friends with some computer scientists and said, we've got to do something to solve this problem of students submitting the same paper in different sections. And so Turnitin started as this little graduate student project. And then we know what happened. Um, I, uh, it is built into Canvas um, at our university now, although I will say for a long time we were, the grand irony is we were not allowed to use it um, because of legal issues. Um, the, our university attorneys said that it was an illegal use of student um, written material. Um, they finally cleared it, but a lot of our instructors still don't use plagiarism checkers because they don't um, like being seen as kind of that their role is to be the enforcer, the police officer who's, who suspects all student writing of being um, plagiarized. That said, um, one really good use of plagiarism checkers that I've seen is um, instructors who assign their students to check their own work um, in the drafting process. That while they're writing and rewriting their paper, um, they submit their own paper to turn it in, they look at the results, and they revise their work based on what they see. Um, and you know, asking themselves, did I quote properly? Did I summarize um, correctly on all of these? kinds of things. So it's used as an instructional tool. Um, the teacher sometimes brings in reports and you know explains and shows how to use it. So it's used to teach proper citation rather than to punish for improper citation. Um, and I think it can be really effectively used that way. And I know that the people at Turnitin actually like you know they pay lip service at least to wanting teachers to do that. Um, but I think it really can be done and it doesn't have to be used in a completely punitive way. So this table said they didn't like Grammarly. I mean, we all know the problem with grammar checkers, right? Um, they are not, uh, they can be really useful sometimes, um, but they can also just be so off the mark. I mean, language is just way too complicated still. Um, for technology to yet, you know, our, our goals of natural language processing have not yet been reached, so. Um, and then blogs and blogs. Um, our students are required to do a kind of um, 
blog style presentation of their writing. Um, it's great for reflective practice. And um, it's also, um, you know, going back to our main theme of autonomy, um, it is a project that that student keeps sort of throughout their career and kind of needs to focus on with and without the guidance of an instructor. Um, and uh, it is an evaluation tool that happens just at the end of the semester, but during the semester, students put up their written work, they reflect on their written work, they can include, um, multi, somebody mentioned multimodality earlier, they're multimodal in nature um, and are evaluated. So there's, um, and, and some of our faculty have also started assigning uh, students to create podcasts of their work as well and to um, you know, author podcasts. And students are super motivated about doing this. And if you teach pronunciation or speech, it's a great, tool because um, students will redo it and redo it and redo it to get it just right. So as planned, yes, 10 minutes left. And um, so final questions, things we didn't get to that you hoped we would, uh, other things you want to add. Everyone's probably, you're keeping me from my lunch. <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you.